So let me start out with a question. Um, I want you to think back past 10 years, past 15 years. Think of some dramatic events. So if you think of some dramatic events with global impact, I'm sure what's running through your mind apart from I split up with my girlfriend, I split up with my boyfriend, are events like 9-11 and the stock market crash. So what do those two things have in common? They're dramatic, but they also came out of nowhere. They came out of left field, no sense in which we saw them coming. Now, Nassim Taleb's coined the expression, the black swan. It's like, if we only have a world with white swans, how on earth could we see the black swan come? Well, I'm going to try and convince you today that that's not a very satisfactory way to leave a science of huge events that impact us over decades. I'm going to try and convince you that big data and complexity are the way forward. Now, first of all, I need to show you, and we'll have a look at what Nassim Taleb was talking about with the black swan. So I have here my, my system. It's my biological system, my economic system. It's actually a bag with a bunch of Lego pieces in it. But just bear with me. I'm going to draw out objects from my system. These are events that I'm observing. These are the events in the big data. I'm not looking. So I pull out one cube, and it's red, one observation. Another cube, it's red. OK. So you're already thinking, he's just trying to kill time, or there's something, <laughs> there's something, something, something so you know, what, what, what's going on? He's got a bag of red cubes. There's a third red cube. Keep this going. Fourth red cube. fifth red cube, but just before you get really bored, I have a blue cube. So the black swan idea is that the only thing science, all the wonderful things that we've discovered, all the wonderful theorems, all the wonderful huge databases that we have, the only thing that we can say about the huge events that impact our lives is that we can't really expect them. But let's have another little think about those events. So I was talking about 9-11 and we were talking about the stock market crashes. What else do they have in common? So what they had in common was that we did it. I don't mean we, but humans did them. And humans interact. They do things collectively and maybe Maybe therein, with the collective feedback, human decision making, therein lies a clue that will enable us, using big data, to go beyond just thinking that everything bad that's going to happen to us is a black swan. So let's, let's just test this out. Let's take the messiest of human activities. Let's take conflict. Now, conflict has no sense. You turn on the news every night, three dead here, four dead here, then there's nothing. Then there are 10 dead in some province in Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera. It's senseless, it sounds absolutely random. But let's have a look at this. So what I'm going to show you on the next slide is precisely those numbers that you hear every night. The threes, the twos, the nothings, and then the 10. And we're going to see what happens. So what I'm going to show you is a distribution of the number of events on the vertical scale versus the number of people killed in that event. So for example, there might be five events with three people killed and six events with two people killed. Now I ask you while I work out how to change the slide, um, what do you think that distribution looks like? And what do you think it looks like for different wars? 
One in the jungle, one in the desert, one fought 20 years ago, one still being fought. Let's have a look. Okay. So on the upper left is exactly that distribution for Iraq. Now, it's plotted on a log-log plot, so what is a power law looks like a straight line. It's a pretty perfect straight line. And it has a slope, and the slope is 2.5. And on the upper right is the same type of data, but for a war a long, long way away, a completely different war, Marxist war, drug-driven, um, cartel-driven, mafia-driven, up in the Andes, across the Andes, it's in Colombia, and it's also a near-perfect straight line. More than that, it has a slope pretty close to 2.5. And in fact, this line down here are all the insurgent wars for which there is data. All the insurgent wars, and that word insurgent will be important in a moment, all the insurgent wars for which there are data, they all have slopes that are straight lines and pretty much clustered around 2.5. And that 9-11 event is one data point on the similar curve for global terrorist events. So if I plot out then global terrorist events and I look at that curve, it is also a straight line and it sits smack on 2.5. Why? Why on earth would that be? Let's have a think of what insurgent groups do. What do they do? You're fighting some huge, powerful state army. You're an insurgency, you're loosely organized, you don't really have much of a, of a training background. What do you do? You try to combine with other people like you, other, other than insurgency. You try to build up units that can effectively fight the state. But every so often, as you're building up your units, you sense danger because that state is a pretty powerful state. And what happens when you sense danger? What happens on all the movies of, of sharks going into um, um, shoals of fish? They just scatter. And if you take those two mechanisms of groups forming up slowly and then scattering every so often when they sense danger, you get a mathematical model that without any computer, just with a pencil, paper, serviette, dirty serviette, you can show exactly gives you a power law with 2.5 slope. Now, what have you gained from that? You've gained from data a really simple insight that maybe, just maybe, it actually doesn't really matter where these things are being fought, and it doesn't matter why they're being fought, because in the end, humans are doing it. And in the end, the way humans form groups and they break up groups is the same. If anyone's talking about, oh, well, you know, what are you going to do with this? Um, well, actually, you know, any war, and wars will come, any war that follows an irregular scheme of a very strong state against an insurgency, insurgency will fall on that curve, and it will be around 2.5. And that's just what will happen. But that's the size of events. What about the timing? You know, black swan comes along. Maybe another black swan comes along. Well, how often are they going to come along? Is there something in that pattern in which they come along? So let's have a look. Here we have black swans coming along, except they're not black swans. These are attacks on coalition groups, convoys, they're fatal attacks. Attacks come every day. 
But these are fatal attacks. So this is work done with Brian Tivnan and Jessica Turnley. Um, now, you wouldn't expect necessarily, if you've ever seen a map of Afghanistan, that what's going on in Helmand and Kandahar, which is where you hear these words all the time, people are there, the troops are there, there's a lot of action going on, might be very different from, you know, expect it to be very different from something off in Kunar, which is up on the you know, upper right-hand side, or Farah out on the, on the left of, the, of, of Afghanistan. Well, there'd be no connection between them. And you're right, Kandahar, Helmand have lots of activity. These others don't really. But what we find is it's not the number of events they have. It's not even when they occur in calendar time. It's the way in which these events arise, the way in which these black swan events arise has a common characteristic. It's not the same for all the provinces. But what happens is it falls on this nice curve whereby this is simply the time, this tau one is the time between the first two black swans arriving. And what's up on the vertical scale, that B, is the escalation rate. And it's not just true for provinces in Afghanistan. It's also true for global terrorist attacks, suicide bombings in Pakistan, and also the Hezbollah period of attacks. Why? Why is that? I don't quite know. But we think it's again to do with a kind of common enemy. It's a humans fighting a common enemy. And the way in which they do it may not be exactly the same, but it follows a similar pattern. So talking about similar patterns, let's go to something at least a little bit less violent, or at least less violent in the sense of, of, of number of casualties. This, um, what is this? Does anyone know what this is, molecule? No? Well, actually, you're looking at the biggest market in the world. This is the foreign exchange market expressed in terms of its correlations. And it passes more money in one day than most countries have as their GDP in a year. In fact, this market, the foreign exchange market, in one week deals more money than the entire US debt. Let's have a look at what it looks like. This is the set of correlations and how they evolve in the foreign exchange market. And you can see this market is having black swan events all the time. The thing is breaking apart. These markets break apart from seconds to minutes to weeks to months. So at the moment, we're trying to understand this in relation to the flash crashes, micro crashes. It's collective human activity, but of what sort, we just don't quite know yet. But there's a clue. And the clue lies in just thinking about what humans do. What humans do when they trade is they make a decision. Do this or do that. Buy or sell. Go here, go there. Take this route home, take that route home. And what they're doing is looking at past information, and they're trying to decide what they need to do to win in this game. And I'm going to use exactly that setup and see what happens when I run that on a computer. This is what I'm now going to show you. So up here on the top, you're going to see the imbalance between people buying and people selling. Now that you see in any newspaper that you look at. But what you see in the bottom, what you're going to see in the bottom, is something that you never see, and which we believe holds the clue to understanding extreme behaviors in collective human systems. So, thanks, Chris. So, we're going to let this run. Now, so far, you can see the price evolving on the top in a way that you might expect, or at least it looks like every other price series that you've ever seen. Now, down the bottom, it just looks like wallpaper. Because, basically, there's not much happening. I'm going to explain what happens in a minute. Oops. Just get that up again. OK, so you're seeing the price on the top. And down the bottom, you're seeing 
I need you, Chris, to stop it in a moment. <laughs> I have a crucial point when I put my hand up. Um, so you're seeing the price down the bottom. You're seeing an x-ray of what's going on in this agent system. Now, so far, nothing much is going on. On the bottom, it looks like wallpaper, as I said. Um, and there's no particular kind of characteristic. But if we run it forward, you're going to see on the bottom, in the bottom of the bottom graph, you're going to see an orange square appear. And this is the precursor of what you're now going to see on the top as a crash. And if we can understand in this way, this was just for an agent simulation, but it looks like the price. And it behaves statistically like the price. It has all the right statistical properties of price series. And if we can understand in terms of what's going on the bottom, we can maybe do something about what's going on at the top. OK. So I think one thing to leave you with is that big data is a great clue about things that we see happening. But I also believe that big data is a great clue about what might happen. Thank you. <laughs>